Do you think there's other alien civilizations out there? This goes into like the, you know, like, are you on the boundary of insane or not? Um, but, you know, when you think about the the structure of the physics of what we are that deeply, it really changes your conception of things. And, um, you know, going to this idea of the universe, um, you know, being kind of small in physical space compared to how big it is in time and like how large we are, it really makes me question about whether there's any other structure that's like this giant crystal in time, this giant causal structure like our biosphere slash technosphere is anywhere else in the universe. Um, Why not? I don't, Why, I don't know. Be, just because this one is gigantic doesn't mean there's other gigantic. There's no right. other gigantic but, ones. But I think when the universe is expanding, right? It's expanding in space, but in assembly theory, it's also expanding in time. Um, and actually, that's driving the expansion in space. And the expansion in time is also driving the, the expansion in the sort of combinatorial space of things on our planet. So that's driving the sort of, you know, pace of technology and all the other things. So time is driving all of these things, uh, which is a little bit crazy to think that the universe is just getting bigger because time is getting bigger. Um, but, like, the sort of visual that gets built in my brain about that is, like, the structure that we're building on this planet is packing more and more time in this very small volume of space, right? Because our planet hasn't changed its physical size in 4 billion years, but there's like a ton of causation uh, and recursion and time, whatever word you want to use, information packed into this. And I think this is also, you know, embedded in sort of the virtualization of our technologies or the abstraction of language and all of these things, these 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 things that seem really abstract are just really deep in time. Um, and so uh, so what that looks like is you have a, a planet that becomes increasingly virtualized. And so it's getting bigger and bigger in time, but not really expanding out in space. And the rest of space is like kind of moving away from it. It's, again, it's a sort of exponentially receding horizon. And I'm just not sure how far into this evolutionary process something gets, if it can ever see that there's another such structure out there. What do you mean by virtualized in that context? Virtual as sort of a play on virtual reality and like simulation theories, um, but virtual also in a sense of, uh, you know, we talk about virtual particles in um, in particle physics, which, you know, they, they are very critical to doing calculations about predicting the properties of real particles, but we don't observe them directly. So what I mean by virtual here is virtual reality for me, things that appear virtual, appear abstract, are just things that are very deep in time in the, in the structure of the things that we are. So if you think about you as a four billion year old object, uh, the things that are part of you, like your capacity to use language or think abstractly or have mathematics are just very, you know, like deep temporal structures. That's why they look like they're informational and abstract is because they're like they're existing in this temporal part of you, but not necessarily spatial part. Just because I have a four billion year old history, why does that mean I can't hang out with aliens? There's a couple ideas that are embedded here. So one of them comes again from Paul. He wrote this book years ago about, um, uh, you know, like the eerie silence and why we're alone. And he concluded the book with this idea of quintelligence or something, but like this idea that like really advanced intelligence would basically just um, build itself into a quantum computer and it would want to operate in the vacuum of space because that's the best place to do quantum computation. And it would just like run out all of its computations indefinitely, but it would look completely dark to the rest of the universe. And I don't think as, as typical, like, I don't think that's actually like the right physics, but I think something about that idea as I do with all ideas is partially correct. And Freeman Dyson also had this amazing paper about how long life could persist in a universe that was exp exponentially expanding. And his conception was like, if you imagine an analog life form, uh, it could run slower and slower and slower and slower and slower as a function of time. And so it would um, it would be able to run indefinitely even against an exponentially expanding universe because it would just run exponentially slower. And so I guess part of what I'm doing in my brain is putting those two things together along with this idea that we are building, um, you know, like if you, if you imagine with our technology, we're now building virtual realities, right? Like 
things we actually call virtual reality, which required, you know, four billion years of history and a whole bunch of data to basically embed them in a computer architecture. So now you can put like, you know, an Oculus headset on and think that you're in this world, right? And what you really are in, embedded in is in a very deep temporal structure. And so it's huge in time, but it's very small in space. And you can go lots of places in the virtual space, right? But you're still stuck in like your physical body and like sitting in the chair. And so, you know, part of it is it might be the case that sufficiently evolved uh, biospheres kind of virtualize themselves and they internalize their universe in their sort of temporal causal structure and they close themselves off from the rest of the universe. I just don't know if a deep temporal structure necessarily means that you're closed off. No, I don't either. So that's kind of my fear. So I'm not I'm not sure I'm agreeing with what I say. Right. I'm just saying like this is one sort of conclusion and you know like in my most sort of like it's interesting because I, I don't do psychedelic drugs. Uh, but when people describe to me like your thing with the faces and stuff, and like I have, you know, had a lot of deep conversations with friends that have done psychedelic drugs for intellectual reasons and otherwise. Um, but I'm always like, oh, it sounds like you're just doing theoretical physics. Like that's what brains do on theoretical physics. Um, <laughs> so I, I live in these like really abstract spaces uh, most of the time. But um, there's also this this issue of extinction, right? Like extinction events are basically pinching off an entire like causal structure. The one of these like I'm going to call them time crystals. I don't like know what, but there's like these very large objects in time, pinching off that whole structure from the rest of it. And so it's like if you imagine that sort of same thing uh, in the universe, I you know I once thought that sufficiently advanced technologies would look like black holes. That would be just completely imperceptible to us. Yeah. Um, so, so there might be lots of aliens out there. Maybe that's an explanation like for holes. all the singularities. They're all pinched off causal structures that virtualize their reality and kind of broke off from us. Black holes in every way. So like, um, untouchable to us or unlikely yeah. to be yeah. detectable by us. Right. With whatever sensory mechanisms we have. Yeah. But the other way I think about it is, um, is there is probably hopefully life out there. So like I do work on life detection uh, efforts in the solar system and I'm trying to help with the Habitable Worlds Observatory mission planning right now um, and working with like the biosignatures team for that, like to think about exoplanet biosignatures. So like I have some optimism that we might find things, um, but there are the challenges that we don't know the likelihood for life, like which is what you were talking about. So if I get to a more grounded discussion, what I'm really interested in doing is trying to solve the origin of life so we can understand how likely life is out there. So I don't think that the, I think that the problem of discovering alien life and solving the origin of life are deeply coupled and are in fact are one and the same problem. Um, and that the first contact with alien life will actually be in an origin of life experiment. Um, but but that part I'm super interested in. And then there's this other feature that I think about a lot, which is um, our own technological phase of development as sort of like, what is this phase in the evolution of uh, life on a planet? If you think about a, a biosphere emerging on a planet and evolving over billions of years and evolving into a technosphere, um, when a technosphere can move off planet and basically reproduce itself on another planet, now you have... Uh, biospheres reproducing themselves. <laughs> Basically, they have to go through technology to do that. Um, and so there are ways of thinking about sort of the nature of intelligent life and how it spreads in that capacity that I'm also really excited about and thinking about. Um, and all of those things for me are connected. Like we have to solve the origin of life in order for us to get off planet because we basically have to start life on another planet. And we also have to solve the origin of life in order to recognize other alien intelligence. Like all of these things are like literally the same problem. Right. Understanding the origin of life here on earth is a way to understand ourselves and to uh, understanding ourselves as a prerequisite for being able to detect other intelligent civilizations. I, for one, take it for what it's worth on ayahuasca, <laughs> One of the things I did is zoom out like aggressively, like like a spaceship, and it, it would always go quickly to the galaxy and from the galaxy to this uh, representation of the universe. And at least for me, from that perspective, it seemed like it was full of alien life, uh, not just alien life, but uh, intelligent life. I like that and conscious life. So like I don't know how to convert it into words. 
is more like a feeling, like you were saying. Yeah. A feeling converted to a visual to uh, convert yeah. it to words. So I had a visual with it, but really it was a feeling that it was just full of this vibrant energy that I was feeling when I'm looking at the people in my life yeah, and full of gratitude. But that same exact thing is everywhere in the universe. Right. So I yeah. totally agree with this, like that visual I really love. And I think we live in a universe that like generates life and purpose. And like, it's, it's part of the structure of just the world. Um, and so maybe like this sort of lonely view I have is, uh, I never thought about it this way till you're describing that. I was like, I want to live in that universe. And I'm like a very optimistic person. And I love, uh, I love building visions of reality that are positive. But I think for me right now in the intellectual process, I have to tunnel through this, this particular way of thinking about the loneliness of being like separated in time from everything else, which I think like we also all are because time is what defines us as individuals. So part of you is drawn to the trauma of being alone. Deep yeah. in, a, in a physics, in yeah, a physics but also part, sense. Yeah, but part of what I mean is like you have to go through ideas you don't necessarily agree with to work out what you're trying to understand. And I'm trying to be inside this structure so I can really understand it. And I don't think I've been able to like, like I'm so deeply embedded in what we are uh, intellectually right now that I I don't have an ability to see these other these other ones that you're describing if they're there. Well, one of the things you kind of described that you already spoke to, you call it the great perceptual filter. Yeah. So there's the the famous great filter, which is basically the idea that there's some really powerful moment in every intelligent civilization that where they destroy themselves. Yeah. That explains why we have not seen aliens. And you're saying that there's something like that in the temporal history of the creation of complex objects that at a certain point, they become an island, an island too far to reach based on the perceptions. I hope not, that, yeah. but yeah, I worry about it, yeah. But that's basically meaning there's something fundamental about the universe where if the more complex you become, the the harder it will be to perceive other complex. Yeah, creatures. I mean, just think about us with microbial life, right? Like we used to once be cells, and for most of human history, we didn't even recognize cellular life was there until we built a new technology, microscopes that allowed us to see them. Right, yeah. so that's kind of it's kind of weird, right? Like like things and that they're we, close to us. They're close. They're everywhere. But also in the history of the development of complex objects, they're pretty close. Yes, yeah, super close. Super close. Like, yeah, I mean, all, everything on this planet is like, <laughs> it's yep. like pretty much the same thing. Like, like the space of possibilities is so huge. It's like, we're virtually identical. So how many flavors or kinds of life do you think are possible? <laughs> I'm like trying to imagine all the little flickering lights in the universe, like in the way that you were describing it. That was kind of cool. It was so, I mean, it was awesome <laughs> to me. It was exactly that. It was like lights. Yeah. The, the way you maybe see a city, but a yeah. city... From like up above, you see a city with the flickering lights, but there's a coldness to the city. Yeah. Uh, there's some, you know that, you know, humans are capable of good and evil and you could see like there's a complex feeling to the city. I had no such complex feeling about cool. seeing the lights of uh, all the galaxies, whatever, the billions of galaxies. Yeah, this is kind of cool. I'll answer the question in a second, but it's just maybe like this idea of flickering lights and intelligence is interesting to me because I, you know, like we have such a human-centric view of alien intelligences that a lot of the work that I've been doing with my lab is just trying to take inspiration from uh, non-human life on Earth. And so I have this really talented undergrad student that's basically building a model of alien communication based on fireflies. So nice. one of my colleagues, Orit Peleg, is, she's totally brilliant, but she she goes out with like GoPro cameras and like, you know, films in high resolution, all these firefly flickering. And she has like this theory about how their signaling evolved to like maximally differentiate um, the flickering pattern. So like she has a theory basically that predicts, you know, like this species should flash like this. If this one's flashing like this, this other one's going to do it at a slower rate so that the, you know, like they can distinguish each other living in the same environment. 
And so this undergrad's building this model where you have like a pulsar background of all these like giant flashing sources in the universe and an alien intelligence, you know, wants to signal it's there. So it's flashing like a firefly. Uh, <laughs> and I just like, I like the idea of thinking about non-human aliens. So that was really fun. The mechanism of the flashing, unfortunately, is like the diversity of that is very high. And we might not be able to see it. That's what. Yeah. Well, I think there's some ways we might be able to differentiate that signal. I'm still thinking about this part of it. So one is like, like if you have pulsars and they all have a certain spectrum to their pulsing patterns and you have this one signal that's in there that's basically tried to maximally differentiate itself from all the other sources in the universe, it might stick out in the distribution. Like there might be ways of actually being able to tell if it's, it's an anomalous pulsar basically. Um, but I don't know if that would really work or not. So still thinking about it.